Hello, my name is Sierra, and today I will be presenting on three different interventions to address the informal recycling of used lead acid batteries in Agbogavlashia, Accra, Ghana. First, I will discuss the issue at hand. Lead acid batteries are rechargeable batteries that are found throughout the world and are commonly referred to as car batteries. These batteries are made up of lead plates and sulfuric acid that are contained in a plastic case. The lead from used lead acid batteries that have lost their ability to hold a charge is commonly recycled. In many lower income countries such as Ghana, ULAB recycling and smelting operations are conducted in the open air in densely populated urban areas and often with few, if any, pollution controls. Unregulated and informal recycling of lead acid batteries, often conducted in homes or backyards, can lead to high levels of environmental lead contamination. These processes usually involve breaking the ULABs open by hand or with an axe, which can lead to the improper release of battery acid into the surrounding soil. Once the batteries are broken open, the lead is removed and often melted in rudimentary stoves that allow lead dust to escape and contaminate the surrounding air, water, and soil. The most common exposure pathway for lead is through the inhalation or ingestion of lead dust. Young children are particularly at risk of lead exposure because of their proximity to the ground and hand-to-mouth tendencies. Because lead battery scraps are often left out in the open, it is common for children playing in or around these dump sites to inadvertently pick up stones or soil contaminated with lead. The health effects of exposure to lead can be both acute, severe and sudden, and chronic, long developing. And the problems caused by lead poisoning are particularly dangerous and severe for children. Health problems associated with lead poisoning can include reduced IQ, anemia, neurological damage, physical growth impairments, nerve disorders, pain and aching in the muscles and bones, memory loss, kidney disorders, fatigue, and headaches. Exposure to high concentrations of lead can cause seizures, delirium, coma, and in some cases, death. An estimated 1 million people are at risk at identified sites. So, I spoke with a banker whose profession is all about money flow. His approach was to use a cost-effective alternative to lead acid batteries, such as nickel cadmium, nickel metal hydride, lithium ion, sodium nickel chloride, sodium sulfur, and flow batteries. A common trend to these alternatives are that though they may be more environmentally friendly, they are more expensive due to the rare earth metals, such as nickel metal hydride, and they also have very limited application as industrial batteries and primarily used in hybrid electric vehicles. And they also have safety concerns due to their flammability, such as lithium ions flammability and their combustibility. The next professional I spoke to was a teacher who suggested that we should begin instituting engineering and emission control measure, measures for battery collection, storage, and transportation. For instance, batteries should not be drained at their collection point. They should be stored securely and sheltered from the weather, and leaking batteries should be placed in acid-resistant containers. There should also be prominent hazard warnings and used lead acid batteries should be transported as hazardous waste. Then there should be automated and enclosed operations for separation of lead acid batteries. Next, we should be providing ventilation, PPE like aprons, gloves, hats, face shields, and training on lead hazards and enact workplace pra practice controls to con protect the health of workers. One downside to this intervention is finding the funding necessary to supply adequate PPE. Finally, I spoke to a policy analyst who suggested that we should enact national policy for the sound management of these batteries, including land planning laws, environmental standards governing emissions and discharges, 
and occupational standards for workplace monitoring. The health sector to recognize lead poisoning and initiate diagnostic interventions, such as ensuring healthcare practitioners have training on and resources for the diagnosis and management of lead poisoning. The health sector should also educate communities and working with the industry, which will reduce employee exposures. A downside to this intervention is the fact that each state's local government may have disputes on land planning policies, and it may take a while to reach a consensus. So what I've learned throughout this project is the following. First, lead-based batteries are still the only technologically viable mass market option currently available for conventional vehicles, including start-stop and micro-hybrid vehicles. There's also a continuing demand for lead and alternative technologies would need to match traditional batteries in terms of reliability, safety, cost, and other factors. And finally, both the environment and health sectors must play their parts to minimize contamination and to protect the health of workers and communities worldwide. Thank you so much for listening and here are my references.